The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. There's no sugarcoating yet. Democrats are going to have a really hard time flipping Missouri's 3rd Congressional District from red to blue. But Bethany Mann believes that fighting for Democratic values in the district that includes parts of the St. Louis area and central Missouri is important for voters. Mann joins us on the latest episode of Politically Speaking to talk about the big issues that are top of mind in the 3rd District and why she says she may have a better showing than when she ran in 2022. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. My promise to St. Louis was that I would do the absolute most for each and every person, starting with those who have the very least. What I wanted to do was look and see what other states are doing. We have to be willing to change those laws, that they are balanced and they affect everybody equally. As somebody that grew up in the St. Louis area, in North St. Louis County, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. We gotta find long-term solutions to make government better, but also to be able to provide services to people. I don't wanna leave that federal money that we've been leaving all these years on the table. We need to be spending this money to take care of Missourians. I thought we accomplished a lot this year, but a lot more needs to be done. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent, Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me in studio today, she is the Democratic nominee in Missouri's 3rd Congressional District. Bethany Mann. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're listening to this, you will also be able to listen to Bethany's Republican opponent, former Senator Bob Onder, who is the Republican nominee in Missouri's 3rd Congressional District. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. This is your second time running for the 3rd Congressional District, but what do you do professionally and, and, and how did you get involved in Missouri politics? Yeah, so that's a big question. So professionally, I'm a chemist. I am a scientist. I work with technology. I solve uh, chemistry problems with robots, essentially. And so I started my career at the EPA where I was an intern and I tested samples for environmental contaminants that had been dumped into our nation's land and streams by big corporate polluters. And from there, I was just the nerd that likes to go and visit laboratories. So one of the reasons I'm qualified to serve in Congress is because of my experience working in agriculture, manufacturing, and water and energy infrastructure. I think that there actually is like a scientist from Illinois, Bill Foster. Are you familiar with him? No, I don't know Bill Foster. Yeah, he represents the Chicago suburbs. I believe he was actually the successor to a uh, disgraced former House Speaker Dennis Hastert. Oh. So, so that area used to be very Republican, but like a lot of the Chicago suburbs, it became much more democratic. So, yeah, if you if you win, there you can you can join the scientist caucus. Basically, <laughs> this is not an easy district for a Democrat to run. And I, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Uh, former Senator Onder is favored in this race because of the way the district is drawn. But like, there still needs to be somebody that runs for these seats. Otherwise, like these candidates are completely unopposed and. I, they are not really accountable to anybody. Is is that kind of the reason you've decided to to run in this, to put it charitably, very challenging political race for you? When I ran in 2022, there was not a chance that I would win. The reason that I ran was because former Congressman Luke DeMeyer, uh, or soon to be former Congressman Luke DeMeyer, uh, got on TV and he lied about COVID. Now, I know that he's not a scientist. He's not a virologist. I you know, don't trust him for <laughs> accurate, up-to-date health information. But he is a banker. He's a market guy. And I know that he reads market reports and read market reports coming out of China that showed that in the manufacturing provinces, something was halting manufacturing. And it was, cause it, it was going to cause significant issues for our supply chain here. And rather than telling the truth about what COVID was, or at least the information that we had at the time, he went on TV and spread some disinformation about COVID that cost his constituents' lives. And that's why I decided to get involved. Now, later, he went on to spread disinformation about the the election and how um, he was 
part of the initiative to sign the Texas Amicus Brief that protested democratically held elections in other states. So it was not the first time that Blaine had got on TV and lied, but that's why I got into the race in 2022. Uh, in 2024, I knew that um, I received more votes than the Republicans who drew the maps thought that I would get. I earned about 34% of the vote. And it is really important that even though I may not have a chance to win a according to what the statistics say, that if you build a really good grassroots campaign and you speak to the issues that that bring people together versus tear people apart, it really, it really kind of dissolves some of that red-blue divide that you see in other parts of the state. I'm still old enough to remember when Missouri was a purple state, and I still think in uh, very much so that it is. It's just that the Trump populism was able to reach hold of the district in ways that I, I could predict because I'm from the area, but most people overlooked. I mean, most folks, when I go around the third and talk about issues that matter to them, you know, they're talking about how their 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 schools are only running four days a week. They have a bus that is 20 years old and might break down so their kids can't get a good education and their schools aren't properly funded. They talk about infrastructure. They talk about how much their electricity bill is. And you don't... and it's not commonplace to hear Democrats talking about those kitchen table issues. And that's created an opportunity for populism that focuses on discontent and division to really to really breed and fester. As you go door to door this time, do you sense that the enthusiasm for Trump is still there? Or do you think that it's waned a little bit, even among Republicans? And I ask this because, look, Missouri polling, to me, it, I always look at it with skepticism. Um, but I saw a poll from Emerson, oh, I don't know, a month ago, showing Trump only winning the state by 10 points. I, I, I'm skeptical of that. I think it'll probably be around 13 to 15 again. But if it really is 10 points, it means that, number one, like he has lost support in suburban areas compared to 2020. And number two, the intensity in the rural areas has really gone down. So I'm interested to hear your on-the-ground reading about where Trump is. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that Trump has lost some support, particularly among moderate Republican voters. And I see that when I'm out on the doors. You know, there there are still Republicans who do not like what happened on January 6th. They think that that was a dereliction of duty, an impossible violation of the oath of office. They have watched how uh, former President Trump has spoken about members of the military and, and folks that they have served alongside. And they just don't like that breed of sh um, showmanship politics. And so I think the Republican candidate who is running against me in this congressional race really embodies um, some of that as well. And so because of those close ties to Trump, it seems to be opening up s some opportunities for, for me and my race. Um, there are still very dedicated Trump voters, but what I've seen in my, as far as my race goes, when I spend time and talk to them about the issues that matter to them, one great example is just over the weekend, I was talking about um, to a Trump voter about the issue of immigration, and that was the, the their top issue. We talked about how even immigrants who are here legally want a clear path to citizenship, and we talked about some of that. Um, once they realized, though, I mean, it wasn't even so much about the issue. It was the fact that somebody, that somebody who was a politician was taking the time to talk and listen to what they thought, and even though that person is a Trump voter, they pledged to vote to me because I took the time to talk to them and listen. And there's still so much opportunity for those discussions, and that's why I think that running in these, what would normally be an uncontested seat, is so important because it allows you to have those conversations with folks to show that you're just not a, a talking, talking figure or a suit. You're actually going to talk to them about the issues that matter the most to their family and the things that resonate with you and your community. And you don't get that perspective unless you're out in the district actually talking to folks. Well, let's talk about immigration. Yeah. Um, there is a really horrible situation in the St. Louis area where a police officer was killed by somebody from St. Charles County 
I don't know if it was in the third or the second district, but that's immaterial. Sure. Um, who was purportedly not in the country legally. He'd actually been arrested in 2020 and then pled guilty to a crime in 2022. Um, and I would say that even people that support a pathway to citizenship would say these are the type of people who should probably be deported from the country. The problem is, though, that this gentleman's immigration court date was like four or five years after he was found to be in the country illegally. Um, And it really strikes me that there are a lot of problems here. Number one, there needs to be a quicker process to adjudicate these type of cases. There probably needs to be more immigration court judges and prosecutors. And it's I've just been kind of confused why, like, Congress has not taken any action to, like, increase judges and prosecutors so those types of cases can be handled more quickly. And, like, a case where somebody is just found to be in the country not legally but they haven't, like, committed a crime or anything are kind of deprioritized. What do you think about that? Sure. So I I think it's pretty clear that in an election year, even though there was a bipartisan immigration bill proposed and it was written by a Republican from Oklahoma – mostly, um, that the issue is more about campaigning and having a slick talking point than actually solving a problem. When in reality, the Republicans who are in leadership, they are running a campaign to to dismantle the United States government. And in doing so, that means defunding judiciary judiciaries. So we're not going to have proper funding to adjudicate those cases because, frankly, the interest is not there to have the criminal justice system in place as it stands under the United States seal. I I guess the other thing, too, is, and this is something that, like, former Senator Onder would say, is that the asylum process is too wide open and lax, where somebody could come in and say, I'm claiming asylum, I'm being persecuted, even if, like, it's not proven that they are. Like, how do you thread the needle to deal with legitimate asylum claims where somebody is fleeing persecution with people who are just coming over the border for economic opportunity, which, by the way, and I've I've actually read this uh, uh, with with the asylum law, is not a reason that you can claim asylum. It has to be like you're fleeing political persecution. How do you thread that needle to make sure people who really need asylum can actually get it? Well, you know, it it really does go back to properly funding our court system so that we can find we can properly adjudicate. It also means increasing the technology that we have available to folks who are working in those cases. Um, one of the issues that, that we've seen down at the border is just even if the technology infrastructure isn't great, you know, you're down in Texas where they're having issues with their electrical grid. They have rolling brownouts in, in times when they don't even have electricity and the infrastructure to even support basic computer functions isn't always there. So... I think threading, you know, if you're going to thread the needle to, you know, differentiate between who's here because they're just, you know, seeking a better life for themselves versus political refugees. Well, that's not in our age of technology. It's not that hard to do those types of investigations. I mean, we're more connected than ever by by way of cell phone and and looking at data and you know, dossiers on political figures and who they're targeting worldwide. That's something that our United States government does have access to. It's just whether or not we're prioritizing, you know, we're we're prioritizing. Every time I've talked with a Republican this election cycle, they have said that the Biden-Harris administration has done a miserable job on the immigration issue. And Democrats will say, well, they supported this bill that you mentioned that was sponsored by Senator Lankford of Oklahoma that would have probably solved a lot of the issues. But like that was two or three years after they had been in office. What's kind of your view of how the Biden-Harris administration has handled the issue of immigration? I think they've done better than other administrations have done in previous years. However, when progress is stymied by a group of Republicans who's main stated goal is to defund government agencies and even block Congress from doing its 
due diligence in its main functions, that it's really a disingenuous ac accusation to say that the president and the vice president isn't concerned about our borders. That speaks to our, our nation's defense and our readiness. And, you know, we don't, as Americans, we don't have to agree on every issue. But when all of your attacks against an opposing party put the health and or the safety and security of America as a country at risk, I think that that we you know you it's you run the da danger of walking into that echo chamber where everybody has to agree with you because your job is to attack America. Well, let's let's shift to foreign affairs for a bit. Uh, when I was talking with former Senator Onder, he's not a fan of aid to Ukraine. I think so. he would cut most of it off. Mm -hmm. What's your thought about continuing to aid Ukraine? Russia wants the war to end. They need to get out of Ukraine. And Putin has stated very simply that Ukraine will not be his final stop in, ex in the expansion of the Russian Empire, that Poland is one of his next targets, and any of the, any of the other countries that surround Russia are preparing for a Russian invasion. So he should be very clear about that. As far as support for Ukraine, yes, we should provide the support that they need. And particularly if you look at into how that impacts the Missouri economy, if you look at Boeing and some of the other contractors that we have here in the state, uh, weapons manufacturing, um, some of the planes, they're, they're made here. So supporting that effort puts, I, I think, I I at least $150 million, maybe $450 million. I'm not sure what that yeah, number and, is. And I, I just want to explain for our listeners what she's talking about here. I think that there's been a misconception that we're just writing Ukraine a $60 billion check and they're using it to do whatever they're doing to defend uh, their territory. The vast majority of aid is us giving us giving them our surplus military equipment and us using the money to purchase newer military equipment, basically. There's probably some instances where we are, like, manufacturing things and sending it to them, like, I would imagine, munitions rounds or something like that. But that's what's going on here. But continue. Yeah. Uh, you stated that very nicely, is that not only are we securing, uh, helping Ukraine secure a victory against an invasion that has impacted so many people in so many significant ways. And when I think about the mothers who have lost their babies and ha and what it must be like to live in a in a place where your home is not safe, it's just really heartbreaking. And to think that that war will continue to spread unless good people stand up and act is, is really quite devastating. And so I think that when it comes to our American ideals, we must stand for freedom and for the values of democracy that show that author authoritarian governments who support, who suppress the free press, who control, who control their media, who, who rule by giving oligarchs all of the resources and, and taxing workers to the point where they can't afford basic necessities, who have to manufacture wars to create nationalism. I think we, our world is so much better off when we support causes that give people power over uh, small groups, whether they be oligarchs or corporations, the, the, the people should have a say and should have confidence in the way that that their government works. What do you think about the idea of like an arms embargo on Israel? That's an idea that has been floated by people like Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush. I'll be candid with you. I'm not sure exactly what specifically an arms embargo would be or whether it can even happen, given that we have treaties with Israel going back to the 1970s with Israel and Egypt and the peace treaty there. But I think basically, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, it may just be like, not sending them any more weapons until the, the war stops or something like that. What, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, I think in general, we want to be supportive of our allies, but we don't want to dictate their strategies or or how they approach their their missions. I do support restricting arms when there are humanitarian um, um, when there are acts of terrorism against humanitarian causes. But in general, I don't want 
the United States dictating those types of things. We should be partners and influencers. We shouldn't be commanding other armies to to fight proxy wars for us, if that makes sense. We'll be right back after this quick break. We'll be right back after this quick break with Bethany Mann. And we're back on Politically Speaking with Bethany Mann, the Democratic nominee in Missouri's 3rd Congressional District. I want to move to domestic issues. One of the things that's been top of mind in the presidential race is tariffs. I know President, former President Trump has talked about issuing anything from a 10 percent tariff on all imports to like, I don't know, a 30,000 percent tariff on certain situations. Um, what's kind of your thought process on tariffs and when they should be used and when they shouldn't be used? Sure. Uh, oh, man, when I hear that tariff line, it, it kind of kills me because who winds up paying the most for tariffs are American consumers. So China, it's not going to impact them if we slap a tariff on something. It's not going to really impact the corporations when we slap a tariff on, on, on something that's imported. What the corporation is going to do is turn around and just charge the American consumer enough so that they are making up their profit margins for that particular piece. Uh, I think tariffs are proposed as a way. I mean, part of the reason that the Democrats lost Missouri was back um, after NAFTA. So we had a bad trade agreement, sent a lot of jobs overseas. And so since then, there has been this discontent of sending manufacturing overseas. So you know, saying you're going to slap a tariff on folks who are importing, it really is just kind of a dog whistle to your base to you know, drum up that anti-China, Chinese manufacturing sentiment when it's really disingenuous. The idea is that, you are you know, even with that tariff plan, the Trump plan calls for a renewal of the tax breaks to corporations, which will mean workers pay more. And then we're also going to turn around and pay more on everyday essentials like like food and stuff that we need around the house. I think uh, the Trump tax cuts of 2017 expire next year. And yeah. regardless of who's president, I'm sure there's going to be a debate over whether they should just be completely, you know, extended or whether some will get repealed and there'll be new. You know, he's talked about no tax on tips and no tax on Social Security. Even Kamala Harris has gone in on the no tax on tips bandwagon. <laughs> um, how would you kind of approach tax policy in 2025? What things would you want to see in terms of like tax cuts? Are there are there areas that you think the taxes should go up? Like you mentioned corporate taxes. Just just generally, what's your philosophy on that issue? Yeah. Uh, so generally speaking, I would like to restructure the ways that we are collecting taxes. I think that less needs to be placed on working families and small to medium-sized businesses, and more tax responsibility should be assigned to corporations. And I'm, you know, I'm talking to corporations that are in excess of $100 million, so it's not going to impact small to medium-sized business owners here domestically. The no taxes on tips is actually a really great plan the way that is proposed by President Harris. Now, a lot of people don't realize that the Trump no taxes on tips really doesn't do much for workers who make below $32,000 and it allows hedge fund managers to reclassify certain types of income to be tips so that they can claim up to $180,000 worth of um, tips is is they, they don't have to classify Yeah, I've income. heard that criticism before like not just hedge fund managers but let's just say you are an accountant and you prepare taxes and instead of charging like I don't know $300 for taxes you're like Oh yeah, this is going to cost ten dollars. But if you could give me a one hundred dollar tip, then that one hundred dollars wouldn't be taxed, but the ten dollars would. Like that seems like a very big flaw in that proposal. Is that basically what you're talking about there? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, and it's not a flaw. I mean, it's it's that's the design of the plan. Is it's to dupe working class Americans who are working really hard. You know, I I worked as a server and a bartender in early on in my career to make ends meet while I was going to school. So it sounds very popular. It's a very populist idea. Um, when we're looking at what corporations are paying, I. I mean, it, I, it was just brought up to me last week in Miller County 
Ameren is proposing another rate increase, and this is after they have had a year where they have made record profits. They have pushed a lot of money into stock buyback programs for their investors, and they are doing very well as a corporation. And if you look over the, the tax policy over the past 40 years, corporations are paying much less now than they were decades ago. So I think just modernizing the tax code so that everybody's paying their fair share makes a lot of sense. And I think where folks really want to see a difference is the, the costs of goods and services here in the United States. And we can do some common sense things to improve that. For example, by securing our supply chain and making more in the United States, you cut you cut costs of transportation and transit. You you can bust up some of the monopolies that are driving the pr- the price increases that are costing families so much. I mean, there are a lot of things that you can do in addition to a smarter tax tax code that can make a big difference to to families and what they feel every every two two weeks or every week when they get their paychecks. Let's talk about abortion because that's top of mind uh, for every candidate federally and state. Yeah. Uh, Amendment three, which would le- which would place language in the Constitution legalizing abortion up to fetal viability, also has uh, exceptions beyond fetal viability if a woman's health, life, or mental health is 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 impacted. What what's kind of your thought on that initiative before I ask uh, follow ups on that? Sure. So my general feeling about the initiative itself is that. It's far time for government to get out of our personal business and dictate to us what what procedures we can or cannot get based on the religious beliefs of political leaders or um, to those who are more disingenuous, just the leaders who are getting really nice pay, um, paychecks from lobbyists who want them to vote a certain way. Um, I mean, because the, the wealthy are not impacted by these abortion bans. You can put your mistress on a plane and fly her to another state, and that's not an issue. Where it does cause problems is even here in Missouri, you have maternal mortality rates that are high. You have health care deserts in parts of the state, and you have people fleeing the state for basic ask- access to health care. And it's just not right. There is no law in the books that restricts the care that a man can receive when he is going to assess his reproductive health. And the issue of having a child in and of itself is an economic decision. And so you're stripping people of their freedoms, not just their not just their bodily autonomy and the right to say what happens to their body, what happens with their body, but also the economic opportunities and advancement that they that they have to su- succeed and thrive. So I am very much in support of Amendment 3. Um, the right to bodily autonomy and access to health care are human rights issues. And these are non-negotiable terms. We will have bodily autonomy and access to health care, and we don't need to ask the state legislator's permission. So this will pass. Um, it is So I'm very confident that it will pass on November the 5th, and that unless we also vote for leaders who support our rights to bodily autonomy and economic freedom, that we are just going to be fighting the same battle in another another two years. So it's important not only to vote yes on Amendment 3, but also to elect leaders who will support and uphold those. Because um, Governor Kehoe has said, or uh, (laughs) um, Mike Kehoe, who is running for governor, has said that that will be his top priority to place stack put things in place to block that amendment, and they're not going to give up. They're, they are coming for not just our reproductive rights as far as abortion is concerned. My opponent voted for restricting IVF. He voted to elim- eliminate IUD access. He opposes many forms of birth control, and it's just it's, it's a backwards way of thinking. If you want to grow an economy, you need to have a state that is hospitable to taking care of all of its citizens, not just not just the men. What would you say to voters in the third district? You may go at the doors and you may say all that. And their response is, I think abortion is morally wrong. And I think that the government should make it as restrictive as possible. So what I hear from folks who don't agree with me on this issue, I'll hear them say that I believe that abortion is wrong And many of them don't realize that the ban has had the impact that it has had. So when you describe, you know, I describe 
um, the abortion care that I needed to receive. I found out uh, I'm, I have two toddlers, and I found out that I was pregnant with Champ, my youngest, the night before the Dobbs decision was decided. And <laughs> it was frightening to me because several months prior to that, I had a very traumatic uh, miscarriage, and I needed abortion care so that I could go home later that evening and hear my baby Randy's first words, which were mama. Um, <laughs> folks don't realize that 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 medicine that they give you to stop bleeding, to stop you bleeding when you're having a miscarriage, that is now technically an abortion. Folks do not realize that the DNC that you may be prepped for, that is now considered an abortion. And folks also don't realize that it's not just your doctor's call anymore. It's the hospital, it's the administrator, it's the lawyers in the hospital, and it's a determination of whether or not they think that they can go up to bat against a state who is really kind of chomping at the bit to enforce and prosecute folks under this under these new restrictive laws. So um, I grew up in the pro-life movement. My mom worked at Crisis Pregnancy Center, as I know all the talking points. I understand also folks who do have that deep respect and regard for life. And I don't think that this is in conflict of it. I, I think that providing people medical care and the freedom to make their own choices is aligned with biblical values, if that's where they're coming from, and that health care access saves lives. That's really the message, is look at the impact that this law has made. It was designed by politicians who don't necessarily have experience treating patients with pregnancy or complications of pregnancy. And a lot of folks don't realize, and you can't have this conversation with some folks because some people have really been radicalized by the talking points. You know, um, we uh, there there was a lot of propaganda around late term abortion and it made it really scary for a lot of people. Um, Pro life magazines would describe in pretty gruesome detail how those procedures were performed allegedly, when really what they were talking about is perinative palliative care, and that's when a woman who very much wanted to carry a baby to term, realized that their baby had some sort of really, uh, really serious medical condition that, mean, that meant that they would not be viable for very long outside of the womb. And so that type of abortion is performed humanely so that the mother can have a couple of moments with an infant that they really wanted in a way that doesn't have that infant screaming for pain. And to take that kind of personal moment that should be between that family and the doctor and turning it into something that the government can investigate, it, it's, a, it's a real slippery slope. I, I do want to just ask this because the opponents of Amendment 3 are going to say you can get what you mentioned if you're miscarrying and that a Proponents are mischaracterizing the ability of people to get miscarriage care under the current uh, law. What would be your response to that? Those politicians aren't spending time in the district talking to folks who are actually impacted by those decisions. So even just this weekend, I heard about a woman out in Callaway County who she couldn't find an OBGYN within an hour. She was driving 90 minutes one way to see her doctor. She had her baby and almost died because of an emergency C-section. And then six weeks after care, she was going into congestive heart failure, and they couldn't figure out why. It was six weeks past the time she had delivered, and she was having certain pelvic pains. And when she went to the emergency room, the, the physician who was there on call would not perform an ultrasound because there was not something that they, there wasn't anything that they could do anyway. So we are seeing people being just denied care and sent home until they're either dead enough to receive care or they are able to follow up with their physician days after to be able to get the care that they need. It's creating unnecessary restrictions. And so to the politicians who are saying we're mischaracterizing, um, they know that they're being disingenuous and they're not talking to the people who are impacted by this issue anyway. So I don't really place a whole lot of weight in what those proponents say. You said uh, you're com you, you have some confidence that it's going to pass on November 5th. And I honestly, I talk with Republicans all the time. They actually can see that it's likely Amendment 3 will pass. Um, I, I was watching a show where uh, noted Republican political strategist David Barklidge said it would pass with 57, 58 percent of the vote. 
but I'm actually a little bit more bearish on it. I, I would say if it passes, it's going to be 52, 53 percent just okay. because I've covered abortion rights in Missouri since I started my career here in uh, 2006. Um, I do think that there are voters who genuinely support abortion rights, including ones who are Republicans. But I also think that, like, as you kind of mentioned, the anti-abortion sentiments among voters, not just politicians, runs really deep in some places. And they it doesn't really matter what's said by either the pro or the con side. If they think abortion is wrong, they're not going to vote for Amendment 3. And if they think it's a uh, it's a it's an inalienable right, as you mentioned. They're going to vote for it, and if they're kind of in the middle, they may vote for it because they think the current law is just way too extreme, are uh, are too strict. So that's not really a question; it's more of an observation. But yeah. like, I guess my question is, why do you why are you confident it's going to pass, given that the dynamic in the state is not the easiest for abortion rights op- uh, proponents among voters in sure. particular. No, I think it's going to pass. I think it m- much of it comes in the way of how the amendment is actually phrased and worded. And I know that there has been a very deliberate attack to deceive voters on what that amendment does and doesn't say. It doesn't say anything about transgender surgeries. It doesn't take away parental consent, none of that. If you read the amendment um, as it st- if you read the amendment as it stands, it allows for the state to place restrictions on fetal vi- viability. It's written actually pretty broad in general. It just says that the you know that I, my, my, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but they are allowed to place it on fetal viability. Um, and fe- fetal viability is described as when a baby can survive outside of the womb without extraordinary medical intervention. But it says the restrictions cannot, like, place, like, intractable barriers on people getting an, getting an abortion. And, and, again, I'm paraphrasing we kind of went through the language on a, another show, but that's what you're referring to. But yeah, absolutely. And that's that's what I say to folks is read the amendment. Just take the time to read the amendment. And I think when most people read the amendment and they realize it's not loaded with, with all of this controversial stuff, then it will pass. And I, I can hear what you're saying uh, about being a little bearish on the issue. I think we're probably going to see it pass with 58, 59% approval. That's kind of where I'm at. I I can see what you're saying, though. There has been some skepticism about whether Amendment 3 passing will help Democratic candidates. Um, I'm sort of of the opinion that if it passes by the smaller margin, I don't know if it's really going to help Democrats that much. 58, 59%, I do not see a scenario where that doesn't affect state legislative races. I'm not sure if it'll be enough for statewide races, but like that type of margin, I think, will impact candidates. Where do you kind of fall on that continuum of Amendment 3 being able to help Democratic candidates like yourself? Yeah, I think that it definitely does help Democrat Democratic candidates like myself and then other candidates who are running for the state House and Senate races. It has been a lightning rod to collect activists and and folks who are coming together to to fight against the restrictions that we have here in the state. So it's been helpful in not just organizing people, but m- motivating people as well. So, you know, everybody had to unify to collect signatures and make sure that every congressional district had the right number of signatures. And then they had to, <laughs> you know, they there, had... There were a lot of obstacles there... to get to this point. <laughs> like, let, let's just list off the obstacles. Yeah. First of all, uh, there were lawsuits to about the uh, ballot summary language. I think there were like two of them. Yeah. Uh, there was an intra- conflict between abortion rights activists about whether that viability language we talked about should even have been in there. Like Mm -hmm. there are some people on the pro-choice side that do not like viability language. uh, But, you know, the viability language won the day. Then you had to collect the signatures in a pretty short amount of time. I think you started in February, which is shorter than usual. Then there was like, I don't know, three or four other lawsuits. And I'm not even getting I haven't even mentioned the fact that the legislature tried to put something on the ballot to make it harder to amend the Constitution, which failed in the last week of session. So I'm just saying, like, if this Amendment 3 ends up passing 
it is a not only a monumental victory for abortion rights activists in the state, it wasn't an, it will not have been seen as an easy victory. Anybody who says like, oh, this was no sweat did not see the context that I just mentioned. But but continue. Yeah, I, you, you really kind of hit the nail on the head is the more roadblocks and obstacles that were placed in front of the this group that was organizing, the more solidified the ranks became to make sure that it passes. And so I think we're going to see historic turnout. And when we overturn the ban, we will be the first of any state that has an abortion restriction to overturn a ban. O- overturn a ban. And if you couple that along with the way that um, in the past couple of years, the Missouri Democrats, especially their LGBTQ caucus, have organized to uh, fight off all these anti-LGBTQ initiatives, um, you have a, a a group of very well organized folks that are out there making sure that people are recognizing our human rights and that our state is not taking away our freedoms. Well, Bethany, thank you so much for joining us on Politically Speaking. As I mentioned on the outset, you can listen to former Senator Bob Onder's interview on Politically Speaking by going to stlpr.org or wherever you get your Politically Speaking podcasts. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. You can read all of our stories at stlpr.org. And how can people find out more about your campaign on the World Wide Web? Sure. You can go to bethanymanforcongress.com. I'm also on the socials, so you can find me at Bethany Man for Congress on TikTok, uh, um, at man for congress on Twitter. And then you can also find me at Bethany Man for Congress on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you very much. And until next time, so long. Politically Speaking is produced by Sarah Kellogg, Rachel Lipman, and me, Jason Rosenbaum. The show is edited by Fred Ehrlich. Read all of our coverage at stlpr.org. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to Politically Speaking by searching the term Politically Speaking on Apple Podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.